Many years ago, I saw a video going around. In it was a machine, but it was in real life. Yet it bore the form of that thing, the mecha. Could it finally be real? Just what was this, and the other attempts? For today, we'll be returning to the unforgiving real world, and tackling those machines in detail, as well as how they dealt with, or avoided, the issues I mentioned in part 1. Now in part 1, I mentioned I could not really calculate the example mecha, as it was kind of a complex issue. What I had wanted to do was attempt to find some kind of manageable middle ground, somewhere in the equations where it was understandable but expressed the problem. But it's just kind of a hard thing to tackle, and it takes a lot of specifics. Thankfully, some helpful folks from the Tough SF Discord helped me out. Specifically, I'd like to thank Matterbeam and David Black for their feedback. As it was broken down, the basic concept is how much energy is needed to move forward, then overcome drag, and finally internal resistance. Specifically, in a small, reasonable mecha trying to accelerate. From them, I can now answer the questions, roughly, in some amount of detail. A 10-ton mech standing about 5 meters tall will need about 500 kilojoules in the simplest sense, which is not too far off from some of my simpler attempts to calculate it. This is how much energy is needed to move forward as a baseline. Drag is double-edged a bit. On the one hand, the mecha has a lot of mass going forward, while also having a big frontal area to contest with. So on the one hand, it's got more area causing drag, but also it's got a good amount of mass to build momentum with, to counteract. Lastly, the internal resistance is a tricky one. As I mentioned in part 1, humans use a very efficient, pendulum-like movement style. This gets anatomically combined with a lot of counteraction and some pretty smooth joints to mean a lot of energy is always returned on each step as best as possible. Here, a mecha could use similar actions via any number of mechanical setups, like springs, oiled joints, or you know, just straight up artificial muscles, to approximate something similar. A 10 meters squared mecha moving at 10 meters per second I went with in my example will then need what comes out roughly not all that much in terms of raw power for a reasonable max of 36 kilometers per hour. Only about 5.5 kilowatts. That's not too shabby. Now the nasty bit is this assumes a very nice baseline, but also this kind of doesn't scale up very well. That big frontal surface area adds up. So by the time you want to hit something, you know, more impressive, more needed to avoid fire, like 100 kilometers per hour, you'll now need a constant output of 158 kilowatts. And this is also where we get back to part one. Whereas cars can just spin their wheels faster and face a much smaller drag issue from that frontal surface, or tanks can rev their engines and transmit it through their transmission, the mecha's legs need to double their speed with each forward step, which in turn faces several times the drag in order to plant each step. What's more, the internal pressure also builds up quite a bit. The internal forces here build up because you're not just moving the legs faster. As I mentioned, the leg needs to stop, come back, and pull through the walking motion while supporting the weight of the machine. This internally makes a lot of pressure by default. When accelerating or braking from that speed of 100 kilometers, as well as the tremendous force exerted into the legs, it all comes together. So what you get, basically, is a leg that then ends up exerting 130 kilonewtons of energy. Now then, you should also remember the static indeterminacy I mentioned in part 1, where the forces inside a leg or any moving complex structure aren't as simple as that of a building. They build up, they shift, and they move depending on how you're using or moving that. So here is kind of an example. Because the knees of our mecha now have to resist a spike in forces that comes out to 1.73 megapascals. Youch. So, in essence, you have a more complex machine trying to go faster, where also its size causes large amounts of drag, on top of generating a sizable amount of internal pressure from how much weight and energy is being dumped through those legs. However, it as well is not necessarily a deal breaker either. The joints sound pretty bad, but interestingly enough, aircraft landing gear are an already pretty well established field that deal with these kind of forces quite often. Landing gear have to support huge amounts of weight, and some, like jet fighters landing gear, have to, in particular, account for trying to absorb a huge amount of energy very quickly from a good amount of mass. 
Even further, carrier specialized planes need to have even sturdier gear, as they have such a narrow space to land onto and quickly dissipate their energy and stop, or else they go into the drink. As I mentioned in part 1, an F-18 weighs 10 tons dry, going up to a weight of around 20 plus tons with added fuel and weapons. So now, let's compare our mecha example to a light, 15 ton Hornet. If we look at the two rear landing gear of the 18 as it touches down, the speed it's going at starts around 27 meters per second, which was our top mecha speed, and can go all the way up to around 100 meters per second. From that, depending on the height of the landing and the speed and force going into the landing legs, it can come out to somewhere between 202.5 kilonewtons and 750 kilonewtons. That force directly goes into the Hornet's internal structures of its shock absorber and wheel, and can then come out to between 30 and 105 megapascals, fully over 15 to 50 times the force our mecha knees have to worry about. So, similar to ground pressure, these large challenges are not the be-all and end-all barriers to making a mecha exist in real life. Just relative engineering problems to solve. Mecha are tough machines to build, yes. They're complex, yes, but we have existing machines that regularly tackle some of their issues. And so, I can say very roughly, it's not mechanically impossible to make a mecha, just complex and difficult. So with that, I want to return to what I started with, those attempts. When I first saw Kuratus, I was blown away. It was exhilarating for that electric twinge of seeing a fantasy exist in real life. It looked like how Mecha was supposed to look. Its design was cool, and it fully kind of bought into that aesthetic of Mecha as well. And as if that was not cool enough, it was going to fight an American Mech as well, one clearly styled in the Western preferences of mechanical design. In some ways, it was kind of too good to be true. But notice, they both fundamentally worked around the limitations of the complexities of legs and their engineering. In Kurata's case, the original base design had no real leg actuation. Instead, it's basically sitting on four reels, with the only real actuation just raising or lowering the machine's larger body. Then, during the actual fight itself, it was kind of funnily redesigned to have the rear of a traditional larger diameter wheel and probably a more direct transmission as well. The Megabots mech also was built off of the chassis of a Caterpillar tread system. This limited the total actuation then to just being the arms of the machines, which is, I mean, neither design was load-bearing, as arms are free, so they had less of an issue compared to legs. Doing a bit of research, however, into the background of both reveals a lot of why these machines were designed this way. Kuratas was first and foremost not a major engineering project, not by a large company or military research. Despite the boisterous name of Suyobashi Heavy Industries, it was mainly the product of artist Kogoro Kurara, which itself kind of explains a lot. He and the roboticist he brought on, Wataru Yoshizaki, later came on to design the actual working mechanics. This kind of shows where the emphasis was. It was kind of in aesthetically fitting the vision of Mecha. So mechanical shortcomings were here a product of the limitations in manpower and money and focus. This was in essence a gigantic passion-driven art project. Likewise, Megabots Inc., which created the Eagle Prime robot, was also kind of in the same boat, a small-scale startup, basically founded by a bunch of people who wanted to see this dream become a reality. It's still a huge passion project. So while the fight was not as dramatic as some hoped, I have seen a lot of people use this as a baseline dismissal. As if to say, see? The mecha just can't work. It didn't really amount to anything. When... All I can really say is, look how far a few crazy driven folks got with what was likely just the money they could scrounge together and take out. This wasn't a multi-million or billion dollar weapons project failure. It wasn't a huge government spending blunder. It's not even a mecha glass half empty situation. Because these attempts were always passion projects. And look how far they managed to get on their own anyways. The Method 2 mecha from Korea was kind of in a similar situation. Aesthetically, it fit the bill but could not really walk. That project in particular hired artist Vitaly Bulgarov, who worked on the Transformers movies, to help design the look of the machine. Once again, it was very cool, but still lacking in that critical step of mobility. None of these projects set about tackling it because of how much of an issue it was. 
Instead, they focused on the aesthetic. They focused on developing as much else of the machine as possible. As a final point, I want to mention maybe the most optimistic example I've seen recently, and one which I find very fascinating. The prosthesis setup from Furion Exobionics. They have taken a different, but equally exhilarating approach. Instead of trying to go for looks, they instead focus their development into capturing the sensation of mecha. In the process, they've also come up with solutions to a number of neat problems I mentioned. First off, while it's not a true biped, instead of going for a straight, typical quadruped, they've gone for an ingenious midway point. One human's ancestors also used. Knuckle walking, or basically how gorillas or chimpanzees move. This means you have the movement logic of a kind of partial biped, but also gain so much more stability. The moving arms and legs are there. A little cumbersome, but at the same time, they work, and powerfully move the machine around. In part 1 I mentioned the issue with dynamic stability and falling over, but here the kind of quasi-quadrupede swinging action and these large tusk-like protrusions take care of that. If the machine topples a bit, it can easily self-right. It's a really smart design. What's more, the control system of the machine does not have to actively work as hard. It doesn't really have to actively balance the machine, because the movement is offloaded to the human pilot to worry about. Instead of mechanically programming auto-balancers, the pilot takes care of most of the issue, with the shape of the machine handling the rest. Then really, if anyone out there is still thinking ground pressure is an issue, they still think it's a fucking excuse at all, here you go. 9,000 pounds, a little over 4 tons, 4 proportional foot pads, no cataclysmic sinking into the earth. So shut up. So, is it a sleekly designed humanoid? No. Is it bipedal? No, not really. But it does exist. It does move via limb-based locomotion. And it can move through all kinds of terrain. The often talked about advantage of mecha. Judging by the fact we both see it do so, and it was directly based on rally cars and mountain bike design. So many years ago, when I first saw Curaris, I saw many people act very dismissively. They expected the final product. They expected this final, full, bipedal machine. But I would tell them not to be so dismissive because we shouldn't expect Mecha to take that leap in one step. I talked about how it took so many vehicles until the Wright Brothers flyer took off. How many decades of nut jobs trying all these different strategies and all these different approaches. Technology is fundamentally a lot of trial and error personal fortunes spent and lost on ultimately failures, passion projects going defunct and nowhere. We have this idea of the fictional version. It's very ideal. It's very entertaining. But it's also that way because it exists in the forgiving world of fiction. In reality, these things take time. So to answer that question, could they exist? Yeah, for sure. Will they exist the way we have seen them in fiction? Probably not yet. Maybe not for a while longer either. But the fact so many attempts have been made, all over the world, closer and closer, bit by bit, means that the day when the sun dawns on them actually being that thing that we think of, and also existing in the real world, may not be so far off after all. <laughs>